please turn in your Bibles now to John chapter 16. Our passage is John 16, verse 5 down through verse 15. I'll begin reading from the second part of verse 4 just to give the context of Jesus speaking. Uh, This is Jesus teaching his disciples, and it is the holy word of God, so listen to it. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Again, this is God's holy word. Well, one of the things that I do most in life right now is repeat myself. If you have young children, you know what I'm talking about. Anything worth saying to a young child is worth saying again and again and again. And that's just how you send the message. That's just the way that it works. I think that's helpful to think about when we consider Jesus' teaching here because the way he introduced this teaching, if we go back to John 13, verse 33, is by calling his disciples little children. He said, little children, I am with you a little while longer. And from there, he continued into the teaching that that has been going on for a couple of chapters now and goes through the end of chapter 16. And he repeats himself. He speaks to them as little children. Of course, they are adults, but the metaphor is showing that spiritually they are suffering from a lot of immaturity, insecurity, fear, a lack of faith, lack of understanding. And Jesus gently works with that by telling them some of the same things again. So at the end of chapter 14, maybe you remember a sermon that was about the Holy Spirit and his work. And today I'm going to preach a sermon that is about the Holy Spirit and His work. And of course there are some new things, it's not identical words, but there are some that is repeated because it's important. Because Jesus wants to send the message and He wants it to get across to us. So I want you to consider that as you listen today. This is a message Jesus wants you to hear. Have you heard it? Have you received it? Do you know about the Holy Spirit? Think about the Holy Spirit. Not only that, do you live and walk by the Spirit of God? Truly doing that is, I think, one of the great privileges and challenges of the Christian life. And so today, we listen again to Jesus give us the good news that we have the Holy Spirit. And through Him, we walk and live by the Spirit. So we'll consider this under three headings today. Things about what the Spirit does, what His work is in the world. First, Jesus teaches us that the Spirit advances the mission. The Spirit advances the mission of the kingdom of God. Verse 5 gives us our first repetition. Jesus says, Now I am going to Him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? Now this is a surprising repetition because it sounds like Jesus is making a mistake. You go back to chapter 13, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Or you go to chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, 
Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? So what does Jesus mean when he says, none of you asks me, where are you going? Well, Jesus has not made a mistake, of course. Jesus is teaching his, his disciples like children. And in fact, there's a bit of a rebuke here in that he is showing his disciples that they ask their questions like children. One of the commentators I read used the example of suppose a, a dad had, fanned, had planned a fishing trip with his son. He told his son, here's the day, here's the, the plan, we're going to go fishing. But then there was an emergency. The dad has to leave and go deal with something else. And so the son asks his father, where are you going? But the question is not really, Dad, where are you going? The question is, why aren't you taking me fishing? It's a protest question. It's a question that I was looking forward to this, and now this is being taken away from me. And so where are you going? And that seems to be the way the disciples have asked their questions. Suppose we take the, the imagery and we, we turn it around. Let's put an adult in the situation, a man and his friend had planned a fishing trip together, and the man is called away by an emergency. When the friend asks, where are you going? The question is not a protest, why are you leaving me? It's a, an actual friendship, a concern. I'm concerned about this emergency. I want to know what it is that's calling you away. And I think Jesus is using this question to redirect his disciples. It's time to ask this question as an adult. Not simply to make the protest, where are you going? But to be interested, where are you going? What is your destination? What is the mission? What is the purpose in what you are doing? I think we see that Jesus is, is making a statement in this way as we read the next two verses. Jesus says, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus wants the disciples to understand that their sorrow is, is a narrow, short-sighted kind of sorrow. It's a sorrow that doesn't understand the mission. It doesn't understand the greater good that God is accomplishing. And, and it doesn't see that what God is accomplishing really is remarkable. What God is doing really is, is not just another event in human history. This is the prophesied hope of the people of Israel. This is the coming of the kingdom of God. This is what the prophets said was going to happen. And the way that we know that this transition is happening is because they told us this will be the time of the Holy Spirit. So we read Isaiah chapter 11, the pouring out of the Spirit on Jesus Christ and his life by the Spirit and all the remarkable things that come along with that. Another passage, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 14 says, The palace has been abandoned, the populated city forsaken, hill and watchtower have become caves forever, a delight for wild donkeys as a pasture for flocks. That's the situation. But then Isaiah says, verse 15, Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will abide in the fertile field, and the work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. Then my people will live in a peaceful habitation, and in secure dwellings, and in undisturbed resting places. This is what happens when the Spirit comes. This is the hope of the people. And there are other passages we can go to as well. I'll just read one more from the book of Joel. As he prophesies about the Spirit, he says, It will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And then here's the hope of that time. When the spirit is poured out, it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. This is what happens when the Spirit comes. And so Jesus says, this is good. What, what, what is about to happen, the departure of Jesus, is the turning point of human history. He is about to go to the cross. That is the next event. He's that, this night he will be betrayed, he will be arrested, and then crucified the next day. He will give his life to, to have his, for the sins of his people so that they can be forgiven for their sins. He's going to rise again on the third day. He's going to reappear to his disciples. He'll be with them 40 days. He'll ascend into heaven, be seated at the right hand of the Father, and pour out the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this is very good news. Very good news. And the disciples, whose version of where are you going is only, I don't like this because it doesn't feel good for me. The disciples are missing the big picture. They are filled with sorrow. But Jesus says they should understand something more. Well, what about you? Of course, you're not living in that historical moment. But don't we have the same basic question to to deal with? How do we view this world? Do we see this world as a world in which Jesus is risen from the dead and the Spirit is poured out? Or do we find ourselves regularly filled with sorrow because things aren't going well. When you watch the news or read the news stories, when you just think about your own life, consider your situation, do you ever ask the question, Jesus, where have you gone? Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, what about my life? What about me? Aren't these the questions we ask as children? I expect you have asked these questions. I know I've asked these questions. And Jesus says to all of us, there's good news. There's good news. He is in heaven. He is reigning. And the Holy Spirit is advancing the kingdom of God in this world. The Spirit advances the mission. And that takes us to the next point. Jesus tells his disciples that the Spirit convicts the world. The Spirit convicts the world. Verse 8, Jesus says, He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now this word convict can have a range of meaning as we use it. You can think of, as one example, a person who is in a courtroom and who is sentenced guilty for their crimes. Uh, On the other hand, you can think of conviction as a a personal experience, something where I I come to a sense of my own sin. And that's uh, the same range of meaning that is in the Greek language, and so you look at different translations of the Bible, you might see different words used here. Uh, But the New Testament is fairly consistent in focusing on that personal idea, that idea of a, a conviction about my own guilt. So just to give one example of how the word is used in the Bible, we can go to Matthew chapter 18, a verse that we often look at when we think about uh, sin or conflict between people. Matthew 18 verse 15 says, if your brother sins, go and show him his faults in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. That phrase, go and show him your fault, is go and convict him. The same, same word. You are going to show your brother that what he has done is wrong, that he needs to have a sense of that wrongdoing. He needs to listen. He needs to turn away from that. That's the idea of conviction. What you do, what you do for your brother, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is doing for the world. And the world, we've, we've just looked at the world last week. The world needs conviction, doesn't it? Go back to chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. The world is a phrase that, that has in view the whole of sinful humanity. That this, this, this group of people that hates Jesus. And, and yes, there's a contrast between Jesus' followers and between the world, but Jesus makes it clear that the, those who are not of the world anymore were part of the world and were called out of it. Jesus said, Matthew, or John 15, 19, 
that I chose you out of the world. And that's how you came to be aligned with Jesus. The world is those who hate Jesus, who hate the Lord. The world needs conviction. Now Jesus himself began this ministry of conviction. In fact, that's why his disciples are different right now. That's why his disciples are hearing this. There are different stories for different disciples. We don't know the personal story of every disciple, but let's review one of them. Let's look at Peter's story in Luke chapter 5. Peter is out uh, in the boat cleaning his nets. Jesus says, we're going to go fishing one more time. Peter doesn't want to do it, but he obeys grudgingly. He'd fished all night. He caught nothing, but as Jesus told him to, he let down his nets. I'll pick up the story, Luke 5, verse 6. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You see how he's transformed from someone who's complaining to Jesus to someone who is on his knees confessing his sinfulness. That's conviction. Jesus takes that, and that's how he becomes and and is affirmed as a disciple. It goes on, amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James, John, the son of Zebedee, who are partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. That's why the disciples are here with Jesus at this moment. That's why they're receiving this teaching, because Jesus has convicted them of their sin, and they have turned to him in faith to follow him. They have left everything behind because they realize that need. The Holy Spirit is going to carry on that ministry of conviction. It it describes this ministry in three different ways uh, concerning three different things. First, a conviction about sin in verse 9. It says, Conviction concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And so the sin in view is the sin of unbelief. And we recognize here that this truly is a spiritual work. Capital S, the Holy Spirit, a spiritual work work you can tell people when they've done something wrong you can tell people the good news of christ but only the holy spirit can penetrate the heart and convince a person my unbelief is not simply neutral my unbelief is not simply me being the way i am no this is a rebellion against god This is something I need to repent of. This is something I need to turn away from. I need to trust in Christ. That's what the conviction that the Spirit brings. Conviction also brings, or the Spirit also brings conviction concerning righteousness. Verse 10, and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. One of the things that happened when Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the Father is that this was his vindication. It's not the only thing his resurrection accomplished, but it's one thing. It shows that this man who died truly was a righteous man. He, he was not bearing the penalty that ultimately everyone bears for sin, the penalty of death. He was bearing the penalty of others. He was laying his life down out of love for his people, but he himself was righteous. And so he was rewarded by God. He was given the life, the eternal life, that he deserved. And so his resurrection vindicates him that he is righteous. But the conviction that we have is not only recognizing Jesus is righteous, it's also what seeing Jesus' righteousness does to our view of ourselves. Because our natural view of ourselves is that we are righteous. Our natural view of ourselves, maybe not that we are perfect, but that we are meeting the standard that, that we have decided is good enough that we are settled in a decent spot. The Spirit will take us and our view of our own righteousness. And when He convicts 
the world, he shows this is not righteousness. You living by your own standards. Maybe there's some good in your standards. There probably is some good in your standards. But it's not good enough. It's not true righteousness. It's not what Jesus Christ has displayed. And so we have a conviction. As I see that my own good deeds are not what is impressive. It is the good deeds of Jesus Christ that are impressive and that are, that are acceptable by God. And finally, the Spirit convicts about judgment. Verse 11, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Ultimately, we know there is a final judgment that comes. There is a punishment, a just punishment for sin, for those who do not trust in Christ, for those who trust in their own righteousness. But there are also judgments that we make along the way. In that sense, I think this judgment goes together with the sin and the righteousness that we are sinful, though we don't recognize our sin. We don't think our unbelief is so bad unless the Spirit convicts us. We think we are more righteous than we should be, uh, should be thinking about ourselves. And we also think we're making decent decisions. We are making judgment calls about things, but we are wrong. And the proof of this is what happened to the ruler of this world, to Satan himself. The one who we know has just entered Judas. The one who is seeking to have Jesus destroyed. And yet he was defeated. He was put to shame. Because Jesus Christ was not doing what he wanted. Jesus Christ was winning the victory over sin. And so when we are convicted, we also realize our own foolishness. We realize that going about according to the course of this world and being satisfied with our own judgments was leading us on the path toward the judgments, the path toward destruction. That conviction shows us we need to turn from that. And so this is the Spirit's work in the world. This is His gracious work to convict the world. And the question for us, of course, is to ask, have I been convicted? Have you been convicted? All of us are either in the world or have been called out of the world. All of us are in need of conviction. All of us need to consider conviction in our hearts. And I think perhaps it is helpful to consider one more example of conviction to show that, that it's not simply about recognizing sin, but it is about the response that the Spirit is bringing us to. There is a, a form of conviction that is what you might call a, a not saving conviction. And an example comes from the Gospel of Luke. You have John the Baptist speaking to Herod about marrying his brother's wife and other evils that Herod did. And the word there is conviction. John convicted Herod. And how do we know? John wasn't just passing public sentence, but John's words were getting to Herod. How do we know that he was getting to him? Because Herod said, I'm putting this man in jail. Now, what was Herod doing? Herod was doing something that we know very well, that we know from our own experience. I've become convicted for my sin, and so instead of attacking my sin, I attack whatever is convicting me. Instead of trying to deal with the sin, I protect the sin by trying to deal with the conviction. So put John the Baptist in prison so that he'll stop talking about my sins. Or, of course, with us, we may not have a John the Baptist speaking to us, but we can resist the Holy Spirit. Say, I don't want you to show me my sin. I don't want to turn and repent. You need to be convicted. You need to respond correctly to conviction not like Herod trying to destroy the conviction but like Peter repenting of sin and the Holy Spirit graciously helps us to do this you may remember uh, Pastor Kelby was here and preached from this passage a couple of months ago um, in the spirit of repetition I'm preaching it again uh, if, if you weren't here for that sermon I encourage you to go back and listen to it. it it was very helpful in thinking about these things one of the things he pointed out that I thought was especially helpful is that when we get to Acts chapter 2 we see the Holy Spirit doing this work we see the Holy Spirit convicting the world people who had been against Christ hearing the preaching of Peter by the Holy Spirit, 
And what happens to them? Well, they show, they show us how to respond to conviction. After Peter has spoken, verse 37, Acts chapter 2 says, When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that is what we are to do with conviction. When we realize that we have sinned and we have done wrong, we are to do, deal not with the conviction, but to deal with the sin, to repent of the sin, and to receive the grace of God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The Spirit convicts the world. Finally, as we look at this passage, we see the Spirit teaches the truth. The Spirit teaches the truth. <clears throat> Verses 12 and 13, Jesus says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. Again, we can see a very strong pattern of repetition between this and chapter 14, I actually decided, if, for those of you who keep careful track of the, the outlines, this is the same point that I used in that sermon. So I, I copied the point because this is the same message. The Spirit teaches the truth. And let's actually listen to what Jesus said. Chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So very similar words from Jesus. The first passage emphasized that the disciples would have the help of the Spirit to remember what Jesus has said. And, and as we looked at it then, Jesus is confirming the disciples in a very pivotal task. They are the eyewitnesses who are going to write the New Testament scriptures, not simply on their own, but guided by the Holy Spirit, so that what we have in the New Testament is the very Word of God. And so Jesus emphasizes that remembering, but now here in chapter 16, Jesus is emphasizing something else. He is emphasizing the guiding into all truth. Again, the writing of scriptures, I think, is the primary application of this. But Jesus says, not remember, but there will be more things that you cannot bear right now. Now what is this new information? I don't, I don't think the idea is that things are completely brand new as if there are things that Jesus never told his disciples. And, and there's one other time of Jesus teaching. You remember after he rose from the dead, there was a period of about 40 days before he ascended into heaven. But Jesus is showing that there is a, a progress there's a maturity that needs to happen, and so the full revelation of God that shows the truth of Jesus' teaching is still to come. Maybe you've noticed, or you may have done this yourself, that if we want to summarize, what is the gospel? What is the good news? Often the place that we turn is to a book like Romans, or Ephesians, or something like that. We don't turn, I think, as often to the gospels, to summarize the gospel. Now, why is that? Is it because there's no gospel in the gospels? No, of course not. Jesus proclaimed the gospel, the good news, but it is actually by design. Jesus wanted the full explanation, the full understanding, the full clarity to be a part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so he actually prepared his disciples for this. He had already taught them these things, but once the Holy Spirit came, then there would be a fullness of understanding and of integration of the message of Jesus Christ. And that's what we find as we go through the rest of the New Testament. I think that's the best way to think about when at the end of thir verse 13, he says, the Spirit will disclose, disclose to you what is to come. That is not just that the Spirit will give you the book of Revelation someday to talk about final things, but, but this whole progress. Jesus is speaking now, and then his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the pouring out of the Spirit, the, the starting of the church, and the advancing of the church. That's all going to make sense. All the pieces are going to fit, and you're going to be able to explain that. 
And that's exactly what we find in our New Testament as the explanation of these things. As Jesus comes to the end of his teaching here, he reminds his disciples of of God's Trinitarian nature. Again, something we've seen in his teaching consistently. God eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person of the Trinity works in a way proper to that person, but as one God. The Spirit's ministry is to glorify the Son. Verse 14, He, the Spirit, will glorify me, for He will take of mine and will disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit is not coming so that He can act independently just or draw attention to Himself. He wants to reveal Jesus Christ. And again, this is what we see in the New Testament. We see Jesus Christ being shown to us and revealed. This is something that may be helpful to think about because one of the, I would say, a caricature of, of evangelical Christians sometimes is that we only talk about Jesus. Uh, we don't talk about the Father. We don't talk about the Spirit. We don't talk about other things in the Bible. We just talk about Jesus and being saved by Jesus. And okay, Sometimes the caricature is true. And so we need to own that, that that has happened at times. On the other hand, I think Jesus showed us that is the entry point into understanding God's revelation. That is how God opens our eyes, that the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what He is doing as He is convicting us of our sin is He is showing us Jesus Christ. And as we see Jesus Christ, well, again, that doesn't make us stop there as if we ignore the others, but verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that He takes of mine and will disclose it to you. It shows us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It shows us the fullness of the glory of God. But this happens by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it is proper for you to talk about Jesus and for you to tell people about Jesus, knowing that as you do that, you are participating with the Holy Spirit with the goal of leading yourself and others to the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Spirit teaches the truth. Again, as we apply this, we see a a secondary application to ourselves. The primary application, again, is the, the New Testament, which is giving us this truth, which the disciples had the specific task of writing down. But our task is not to write, but to keep, to read, to treasure, to study, to believe, to obey. And so this is how we continue to submit to the ministry of the Holy Spirit is by using the scriptures that he has given us. And so today maybe is a good time to check. We're at the first week of May. Maybe you started a Bible reading goal at the beginning of this year. Perhaps you have been committed to the memory program. How's it coming? Has it continued on? Have you fallen behind? Perhaps you need to reset goals, but do you devote yourself to the Word of God? That is the challenge that Jesus gives here. Are you devoted to the Word of God? And then here's here's the simple test that Jesus gives here to know whether this is an effective devotion. Do you glorify Jesus Christ? Because this is the Spirit's ministry, right? That He teaches us the truth. He's the Spirit of truth. And the, what's accomplished by this is that Jesus Christ is glorified. And so in your study of God's Word, in your learning of it, does then that translate into living it? Does that translate into a life that shows the glory of Jesus Christ? Who gets the glory from your life? Is it yourself or is it Him? The Spirit teaches the truth, and in doing that, brings glory to Jesus Christ. And so this is the work of the Spirit. He is advancing God's mission. He is convicting the world, teaching the truth. I trust that for many of you, this is not brand new information. These are not things you have never thought about before, and yet that's not the point, is it? The goal is not to learn something brand new every time you come to church often. The goal is to be challenged to take what you know and to live like it is true. To have the same thing repeated, but then to test your own heart. And so the question is, 
Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, in this Holy Spirit, the one who is at work in this world, who's spreading the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, the one who is convicting people of sin, the one who is for us very good news because of the work of God in Christ? The good news of today is that he is active. He is at work. So believe in the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you that you kept your promise, that you sent the Spirit just as you said you would. We thank you for the way that we see the Spirit's work in our own lives and the conviction you have brought us personally in the lives of others. Lord, we long to see more of the Spirit's work. We ask that you will teach us more of your truth, that you will convict us of our sin, that you will help us to see the mission of God and to be a part of that. Lord, we pray that you will work in the hearts of those who do not know you, who perhaps have been convicted but have just fought against that conviction and it's only been partial. We pray that you will soften hard hearts. We pray that you will convict those who have not considered their sin so that they will see their sin and turn to you. Holy Spirit, we know that you do all that you have been sent to do, and so we pray this with confidence. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.